American Family Radio. And Urban Family Talk. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. One point. Two million babies are going to be aborted this year. It's unbelievable. But AFR and Preborn Ministries is helping to change that. And we want you to come alongside us. My wife and I have personally visited preborn pregnancy centers where ultrasounds have been installed and they are changing. And saving lives, changing the life of a mother and a father from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them to helping them hear a heartbeat, see an ultrasound, and choosing life. I hope that you will give to this very important ministry. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here in American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. That was the voice of AFR Zone Dan Celia talking about his, his personal experience with he and his wife with the pre-born ministry. We are in the middle of our campaign raising funds to come alongside this ministry to offer ultrasounds to women who might find themselves in difficult situations where they may be considering, uh, where they are considering uh, abortion as an option. Um, and we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus to be able to offer them an ultrasound. The, statist- the statistics have shown that 80% of the women who are able to have the benefit of an ultrasound where they're able to see their babies or hear the heartbeat of their little ones, um, that 80% of them keep their children. I think it's critically important, and I heard this, and I think this was, a, this was an amazing observation. When we talk about uh, women who are abortion-minded, I think we should probably change that because the fact is when they have those little ones um, inside of them, they're mothers. So the reality is that we're considered, we, we are addressing mothers who are considering terminating their pregnancies. What Preborn Ministry does is that it, they work with hundreds of Christian pregnancy, pregnancy resource centers across the country providing life-saving services such as ultrasounds. In addition to the ultrasounds, they, off, they also offer the gospel and they offer to be to walk alongside these mothers throughout the lives of their uh, of their babies. Preborn centers have counseled over two hundred seventy thousand women who are who were considering abortion, two hundred seventy thousand mothers who were considering abortion, and over forty eight thousand babies have been saved. Ninety one thousand women have heard the gospel through preborn's ministry, and over twenty four thousand have surrendered their lives to Christ. So what we're inviting you to do is to join us uh, by providing ultrasounds for mothers who are, unfortunately, abortion-minded. A gift of $28 provides one uh, abortion-minded mom a free ultrasound. All of this is offered to these mothers free of charge. $28 provides one ultrasound. $140 provides five ultrasounds. And our goal with this campaign is to save 3,000 babies. And we're asking you to help us to do that. If you are hearing me and you are stirred to join us um, in 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 supporting this ministry, you can call 877-616-2396. That number again is 877-616-2396. Or you can go online to AFR.net and give securely right there on our website. We at American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk we don't want to be people who, who talk incessantly about the problems. We want to be a part of the solution. And we have found you, our listening audience, to be the most committed partners in being the hands and feet of Jesus, where we want to uh, save the lives of little ones and minister to the hearts and minds of abortion-minded moms. So would you join us? AFR.net, you can give securely there, or you can call 877-616-2396. Now, for the most uncomfortable segue, can you think of anything (laughs) that is more uh, alarming 
than the University of Alabama finding a quarterback who could throw the football down the field. That is insane. I didn't stay up to watch the game. I fell asleep, and then I woke up because I had a child whose foot met my face in the middle of the night. That tends to happen time, time to time. And I woke up and said, man, this game is still on. And I learned, <laughs> this, is, this is an embarrassment of riches, that Alabama has a quarterback that can throw the football. Now, I and my oldest son were happy to learn that this guy is a committed Christian from Hawaii. I can't pronounce his last name, so I'm going to just call him Duo. Man, they took their starting quarterback out of the game. Because when I went to sleep, Georgia was winning. I wake up to find roll tide. Again. Again. And I've said this before, but I'll say it now. I guess the uh, those tombstones that were engraved here lies... The once mighty SEC, I guess they got to roll that back. Because yeah. the SEC is still kicking you-know-whats and taking names. This is crazy. But congratulations to Alabama and Nick Saban. I want to remind everybody that Nick Saban's first championship didn't come in Alabama, in case y'all wondering. I'll let you do a little internet searchy-searchy to find out where it came from. But it might sound might be from a place that rhymes with oot. And they might have a coach right now that sounds like Bobby Poucher. And water boy. Go Tigers, go. <laughs> LSU is what I'm talking about. But I've got I've gotten sidetracked. I have some serious things to discuss today, I promise you. But congratulations to Alabama again. Some people think that's they they're bored with football because Alabama's winning. I'm not, quite frankly. Maybe I'm weird, but I, I like to see excellence. I mean, you can say what you want, but some kind of way I, Nick Saban is continuing to extract greatness from these players. I like to see that. I like to see that, and I also like to see the uh, attempts to dethrone him, so to speak. For example, it's not lost on me that it just so happened that a Nick Saban disciple was the one who was coaching against him in this game. Get that for what it's worth. Anyway, I do have some serious content to get to, and I will get to that now. Um, I'm going to begin in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 9. 1 through 9. And um, this is the scriptures that we're talking about now will, will actually surface throughout the program today because um, in case you haven't noticed it yet, we are living in the last days. And, and, you know, I have been talking quite consistently on the program, especially during this new year, about the necessity of the gospel. And it's becoming more and more evident. I have some news and things that may not be top brow news items, but there are things that I'm just keeping my eye on that I'm paying attention to and that I feel like it's important to bring to your attention so that you and the audience can have an, a, a better idea of what's going on. I know uh, many of us are busy. I, I can tell you as a, a former prosecutor, I work routinely, 70, 80-hour work weeks. And many of you don't have the time to survey the stories and things that are going on. So I see myself as coming alongside you and, and, and helping you to stay abreast of the issues that are prevalent and that are pressing that we need to be aware of so that we can be effective as salt and light in this day and time. Well, here we go. 2 Timothy 3. This is, we were in 2 Timothy, in uh, Paul's epistle to Timothy, one of Paul's epistles to Timothy yesterday. Uh, this is, again, Paul attempting to instruct his disciple as he is uh, growing as a leader in the Christian faith. And he says this in writing to Timothy, and we are the beneficiaries of these writings because the Lord was instructing this to us as well. He says, but understand this. That in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. There will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self. Mm, Lord have mercy. Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Mm. Ungrateful. Unholy. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid, avoid such 
people. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. Now, Paul is listing these things out to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3. I just read verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5. Paul is writing this to Timothy and, and sharing it with him as a, a means for him to evaluate <laughs> when the last days are upon us. I've said, I said yesterday, and I'm going to say it again today, that when Paul penned this, he clearly viewed himself as living in the last days. And all New Testament writers who refer to the last days see them as having started at the time of the day of Pentecost and continuing on through the present and current age. I would add that when you look at this list and you see what's happening, how can you come to any conclusion other than recognizing that we are in the last days? Then you add into this conversation Peter's writings when he says, and you know what? When the last days were present, there will be many people saying, ah, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Where is his coming? You said he's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. And people are saying that right now. Paul lays out that men would become lovers of self and of money, proud, arrogant, abusive. And then right in the middle of all of these things, he includes disobedience to their parents. I can't tell you the numbers of conversations I've had with people who just accept and embrace disobedient children as if it is a natural phenomenon of adolescence. To which I say routinely, no, it's not. Children who are rebellious and disobey their parents are not merely going through a phase. It's evidence of a spiritual deficiency. It's so important that the Lord included it right there among this list. He also <laughs> said that men would be heartless or without natural affection, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. Now, in, in many people's understandings, when the Bible says without self-control there, they think exclusively. They think exclusively that it's, it's talking about an inability to control oneself, which that is included in the scriptural understanding. But it is not limited to an inability to control oneself. It also includes a lack of desire to delay gratification, to control one's basic urges, to have restraint upon a beastly natural inclination. That is included as well. Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, Swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Avoid such people. I'm going to set this up now because I see we're coming close to the end of this break, and this, this will carry over into the second segment. I have a story, and, and quite frankly, I'm not going to tell you where the publication came from. Uh, I will mention the author's name of this particular story. But I will not tell you where the publication, the publication, because I, I, I don't think you want to go and dig this story up. I think the, the risk for harm far outweighs the potential for good. And I'm going to I'm going to do my best to inform you with the uh, pertinent components for the sake of our conversation here. So you can know why I'm bringing this up in the context of this scripture, because the details in this story, I'll, I'll just tell you, they, they border on liter literary pornography. I'll just tell you. Uh, and I don't want to be responsible for introducing that to you. But the author's name is Emily Chang. And the headline for this story is Inside Silicon Valley's Secretive Orgiastic Dark Side. Yes, I did say orgiastic. This is one of these conversations that if you have young ones around, you may want to hit the pause button or double back to this a little bit later because I'm going to be dressing some content. It won't get into colorful language or anything like that, but I'm going to talk about some of the technical manifestations of what I just read. More specifically, men being lovers of money, arrogant, abusive, and lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. Inside Silicon Valley's secretive, orgiastic dark side. We, we, we're pulling up to the curb right now, but we're about to kick in the front door. On the other side of the break, you're listening to the Hamilton Corner. Stay with me. Life-giving regulations in Alabama. Hi, I'm Matt Staver with Freedom's Call. 
Liberty Council is submitting our amicus brief today in Alabama where an abortion clinic is fighting two laws. The first law prohibits abortion clinics from being located within 2,000 feet of a K through 8th grade school. The second law prohibits the most common second trimester abortion called dilation and extraction. This horrendous process brutally dismembers preborn babies. Medical research has found that this procedure causes immense pain to the unborn child who feels pain more than you and I do. Liberty Council is arguing that these restrictions will and should protect our smallest citizens against this brutality. In a civilized society, there is not a right to cause intense pain and death to another person. We must make the womb a safe place once again. Please pray as we help defend the lives of these precious babies. Stay informed at our website, lc.org. I'm so tired of sour Christians. You know the ones. They think that godliness is measured by seriousness. Man on a tour of America's natural wonders saw the Grand Canyon. Magnificent mountains, old faithful. And he yawned at every sign. Eh, not impressed. The guide said to the others on the tour, just ignore him. If you don't have it on the inside, you can't see it on the outside. Did you know that the early Christians called the Holy Spirit the Happy Spirit? Listen, never take yourself or what you do too seriously. Just take Jesus seriously. Then you'll have it on the inside. I'm Steve Brown. You think about that. Share what you just heard with a friend. Go to youthinkaboutthat.com. Cross-examine. What is the most important skill you need to learn if you want your life to be a success into eternity? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the answer to that question is to properly interpret the Bible. That's the skill you need to have. Listen to Cross-Examine with Frank Turek, Saturday mornings at 9 Central and Sunday afternoons at 4 Central on American Family Radio. Women and men alike find themselves in despair after an abortion. Every woman who had an abortion was for a short time a mother, every man a father. But afterwards, they're all people in pain, anger, sadness, relationship problems. These often accompany an abortion. But there is hope. Call 866-482-LIFE. Your call is confidential, and you'll be talking with someone who has already been where you are and found the way out. 866-482-LIFE. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Noah, born over 2,700 years B.C., was a shipbuilder and a prophet of the century. Many think of Noah and the ark as a story from the past, but did you know that according to Jesus, the events surrounding the life of Noah are directly related to you? Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, the things that happen in Noah's day will be similar to the things that are going to happen during the time referred to in the Bible as the end of the age. But of all the signs, the one prevalent thing that happened in Noah's day was that people who knew right from wrong chose to ignore Noah's warning of God's coming judgment, such as the way of the 21st century. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here in American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. That was the voice of evangelist, apologist, author Ray Comfort really discussing Matthew 24 and, and again hitting on the very same theme that Apostle Paul was conveying to Timothy that Jesus himself articulated in Matthew that uh, at the end of the age, <laughs> men would be in such a deplorable moral state that um, they, although they know the standards are right and wrong, would be so given over to lasciviousness. Um, that they would almost be um, oblivious to the fact that Jesus is on his way to return. This particular art article written by Emily Chang uh, chronicles, and I shared the, the, the headline for the article already. In the story, she writes, about once a month on a Friday or Saturday night, the Silicon Valley Technorati, meaning the, the big wigs, the heads, and the tech world, gather for a drug-heavy 
sex-heavy party. Sometimes the venue is an epic mansion in San Francisco's Pacific Heights. Sometimes it's a lavish home in the foothills of Atherton or Hillsborough. On special occasions, the guests will travel north to someone's chateau in Napa Valley or to a private beachfront property in Malibu or to a boat off the coast of Ibiza. And the Bacchanal will last an entire weekend. The places change, but many of the players and the purpose remain the same. The story chronicles that it includes people that if their names were mentioned, you would know exactly exactly who they were, all the way down to the -the run-of-the-mill coder who's working for your Googles, your Facebooks, your Space Spaces, and all of these technological companies. He goes on, the stories I've been told by nearly two dozen people who have attended these events or have intimate knowledge of them are remarkable in a number of ways. I want to share with you some of the ways that she found these stories and events remarkable. Of course, that this writer is a, a secular writer who has her own objective in writing. And I don't think she had any idea someone like me would pick, on, pick up on the things that I picked up from this article. But I think it's worthy to be explored here on the program. She says, quote, many of the pa- participants don't seem the least bit embarrassed, much less ashamed. On the contrary, they speak proudly. Hear me well. They speak proudly (laughs) about how they're overturning traditions and paradigms in their private lives just as they do in the technology world that they rule. Their behavior at these high-end parties is an extension of the mindset And the audacity, if you will, that make these tech founders think that they can change the world. And they believe that their entitlement to disrupt doesn't stop at technology. It extends to society as well. Now, what am I talking about? These parties include men, women, people who are married people who are unmarried, those in open marriages, those, I mean, they run the full gamut. And reading the story, (laughs) the thing that stood out to me is that this is not merely your run-of-the-mill lasciviousness, if you will, but these are people who are intentional about changing not only the world through their technological innovations and advancements in in, in business and enterprise, they also see themselves as almost the barbarians at the door of society itself. They see themselves just as Facebook has revolutionized the way we communicate as individuals, they see themselves as the champions of a movement to transform the way that people interact with each other in regular society. Chief among their desires to shift paradigms and social expectations is the way we relate to one another sexually. Whether you're married, unmarried, it shouldn't make a difference in terms of who you engage with physically. Whether you are the boss or an inferior employee, that shouldn't limit who you engage with sexually. And so the thing that stood out to me from this reading this We have not merely the lust of the flesh, but we have the added components of the pride and arrogance and hubris that develops from people that see themselves with a somewhat of a messiah complex because of their technological innovations, which takes it to a whole nother level. Just as, and and this is out of the mouths of these individuals themselves, just as things like Amazon have revolutionized how we buy books, and how we grocery shop and, and, and the way that Google has, you know, just taken the tech world by storm. They see themselves as reshaping society in their own image. Mm. And you had and I thought when I was preparing for this, I thought about my conversations with the activist mommy, uh, Elizabeth Johnson, that we'll have on the program again soon, where she was the first person that I had talked to personally who had been put in Facebook jail because of the content of her 
articles and her writings and her video. Then I myself, before I even got on the AFR platform, when I was just on Urban, I was put in Facebook jail after an interview I did on Fox News. And there are many of us, and you know, there was a big brouhaha with, you know, the social media giants censoring conservative content where Glenn Beck went to meet with Mark Zuckerberg and others, and they had this, you know, this kumbaya uh, moment of peace to where I sit back and say, hmm, you know what? The time is coming <laughs> if we're not already here where we will have to contend with these people because they will figure us, people like me in this program, to be their enemy. Why? Because I have this thing, you know, that in their minds, this is this old antiquated, non-digital document that's reduced to black and white that says things like, why does the heathen rage? That they would consider to be antiquated, limited rigidity. When they are the vanguards of technological modern innovation. What I'm saying in, in short supply, that a part of this pursuit where men become lovers of themselves and lovers of pleasure to where you add in the, the, the dangerous component of a pride field hubris based on natural success. You know, why can't I sleep with whoever I want to sleep with, when, where, how? I'm changing the world through technology. Don't you know I just invented a self-driving car? I make people's lives better. Who are you to tell me that I need to be held to some standard in terms of who I have sex with? It is, and, and, and I'm intentionally not going into the details of this article because quite frankly, it, it, it's, 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 it's disgusting. It really is. And when you stop and think that these are the people <laughs> who fancy themselves as the leaders of the world, the, the shakers and movers, and many people in the world are esteeming them as a certain way. And I said this before, listen, every believer who is listening to me, we have to get to the point to where we don't ascribe moral quality to what is nothing more than talent, okay? If a person sings a song well, that doesn't mean that they're a great person. That means that they're a good singer. But just because you're a good singer doesn't mean I need to seek you out for marital advice. But but the unfortunate reality is that often believers are, are pushed into the corner uh, of being old fuddy duddies or, or, or being rigid in their thought processes. And there's this tension and this temptation to want to look cool and slick and chic to the world where we want to say, yeah, man, I can jam to what you jam to. Yeah. You know, Oprah is amazing. Listen, Oprah is amazing at her media company. But Oprah is not an amazing individual. I don't want my daughters looking up to Oprah to find out how to be a 30-year uh, girlfriend. You hear what I'm telling you? I don't want my daughters looking up to Oprah and get caught up in the, the chapter that I was reading uh, in 1 Timothy where it goes on and it talks about uh, 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 weak-willed women being stolen away from the faith. And it was hitting on a, 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 a heretical teaching called antinomianism where you had people so burdened down in their own sinful lives that they were willing to embrace an ideology that says, hey, there's no such thing as sin. This is not a new deception. This is a deception that has been around, but it's just repackaged for our generation. Oprah comes around with her newfold pagan spirituality and, 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 and new mangled new age teachings, and she's saying the same old things that the antinomians were saying in Timothy and Paul's day. That there is no sin. God is in you. Whether you call him God or the light or the force or the energy, God is in you. And that's attractive to people who are unwilling to be, to stand on the rock. And so in reading this, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this and I'm reading this and I'm saying, hmm, it's no wonder that these are people that are creating things like Snapchat an app that allows you to take a photo or video that disappears in seconds. Who else will want that other than the people that are participating in these orgiastic parties once or twice a month? Where they are getting down with the get down, but they don't want the evidence to come out. 
I can't tell you the numbers of cases I've handled personally as a prosecutor that's been the result of these apps when you have young, young people that are engaging in things that parents are unaware of, and the next thing you know, you have a sex trafficking victim or a sexual assault victim or a kidnap victim or a murder victim. Because it's coming from the minds of these people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they'll go through great lengths using their money and their resources to develop legal disclaimers. Well, he's not responsible in case your kid is unfortunately kidnapped and, and they have a video that they put up on the website that happens to be uh, erased that we can't tell you where it is. I can't tell you the number of subpoenas I filed to compel these tech, tech companies to release data that may have erased from your phone, but they sure keep it. Because it's coming from the minds of these people who are lovers of pleasure and lovers of self, and are boastful and arrogant. So, Abraham, what are you saying? Are you saying that we shouldn't embrace technology? No, I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not running around here with a flip phone myself. But let's be very careful that, one, that we're using technology wisely. Wisely. And, two, that we don't confer upon people a status simply because they made a good social networking website. Mark Zuckerberg made a great tool called Facebook. But that don't mean I want Mark Zuckerberg to be my president. That doesn't mean that I feel great if I have a personal conversation with Mark Zuckerberg. Hear me well. There are people that they are, they are stirred up by celebrity. People who they believe have power and influence that it makes them feel that, that, that their hearts beat at a different rate because so-and-so is in their presence. Listen, if you are a member of the kingdom of God, you have the greatest identification that could ever be. That could ever be. I can't tell you, and I've said this before, the numbers of conversations I've had with some of the older saints who they know God has, has given them a conviction. They know what the word of God says, but they refuse to correct their wayward young adult child or their wayward young adult grandchild because little Junebug has gone to college and got some learning. And I'm telling you, the Bible says fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It is the Lord who makes wise the simple. And I don't care how many degrees you may not have. If you fear the Lord, you are on the fast track for wisdom. You have more wisdom in your pinky finger if you fear the Lord than, than the most uh, learned PhD waving atheist you could ever meet. Because there is no wisdom without the giver of wisdom. There may be people who can spout off a lot of facts and information, but facts isn't synonymous with the truth. And so I, I just felt compelled to share this with you that as we go through the new apps, and I, and I, I came across something myself yesterday, a new, uh, new to me. It's not new to other people. I think it's been around for a, a couple of years now. But booster fuels to where you don't have to go to the gas station if you're in certain areas. I know they're operating in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You use the app, and the gas truck comes to where you are. That's a, that's a great idea. That I would add is really only able to flourish in a country like America where you have capitalism, where you have these types of ideas that can compete and generate income. But I digress momentarily. But that doesn't mean I'm going to call the, the creator of Booster Fuels a, a wise and all-knowing guy who I want to receive counsel from for my marriage. No. And on the other side, I'm not saying I couldn't get counsel from them, but just because they make Booster Fuels doesn't make me want to become, you know, a person that I'll seek counsel from them for. Y'all get what I'm saying. And so I just found this reality, this reality. Th Y'all, this is facts. This, this is not opinion. This is happening right now. The people that are making these technological things, they are given over to lasciviousness, many of them. Given over to it. I have another story that I meant to get to now, but one of the Ninth Circuit judges, Judge Alice Kaczynski, who was forced to resign because of his nastiness forcing himself and, and being inappropriate sexually with female attorneys and has to resign because he's nasty. And what I'm saying, you're seeing this percolate throughout our culture. It's happening in Hollywood. It's happening in Hollywood East, which if you wonder what that is, that's Washington, D.C., by the way. Hollywood East. It's happening in Silicon Valley. It's happening from the waff and the woof of our country that we're given over we're given over to a rotting culture. But the people of God, we've got to stand. Here's some great 
News. If you miss the deadline to sign up for health insurance, or more importantly, if you signed up for a plan that you're just not happy with, you still have a choice. It's called MediShare. MediShare is a Christian health care sharing program that's been around for 25 years, and they have hundreds of thousands of members all across the country. And get this, over the years, MediShare members have shared more than $1 billion of each other's medical bills. Best of all, you could save a lot of money with MediShare. The typical savings for a family is about 500 bucks a month. Your savings could be more or less, but think about what you could do with that extra money. Think you're stuck with a high-cost health plan that doesn't have a lot to offer? Well, think again. You can join MediShare anytime, so call them today and check it out. Here's the number to find out more, and there's no pressure. They're super easy to talk to. 855-PSALM-23. That's 855-PSALM-23. 855-PSALM-23. Praying to Jesus. This is Ken Ham, co-author of the book on the case against racism, One Race, One Blood. All this week, we're continuing our series on who the Bible says Jesus is. We've seen that the Bible teaches he's God in the flesh. He's not just a man or a good teacher. He's fully God. The early church of the New Testament knew this, and that's why they prayed to Jesus. In the Old Testament, people called on God. In the New Testament, Stephen called out to Jesus as he was being stoned. The Apostle Paul says Christians are those who call on the name of our Lord Jesus, and Peter tells people to call on Jesus to be saved. Jesus even tells his disciples to pray to him. Prayer is to be addressed to God alone. By praying to Jesus, the early church showed they believed he was God. Discover more about the World Class Creation Museum at AnswersRadio.com. Plan your visit and take a walk through biblical history when you go to AnswersRadio.com. Hello, Americans. I'm Todd Starnes with news and commentary next. Now that's what a good deed sounds like in the North Georgia mountain town of Blairsville. About nine years ago, a bunch of men at Antioch Baptist Church started a ministry providing firewood to families in need. It gets cold up in the mountains, and a good many folks still rely on wood-burning fireplaces to stay warm. And some folks still make their cornbread on wood-burning stoves. Over the years, other churches have joined the Baptist, most notably the nearby Lutheran Church. They brought along a rather large chainsaw, but there are plenty of axes and log splitters, too. They give away the wood on the third Thursday of the month. There's always a line of pickup trucks filled to overflowing with kindling. Just enough to meet a need. So here's to the kind-hearted men of the Antioch Baptist Church, warming homes and hearts in the North Georgia mountains. I'm Todd Starnes. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net and UrbanFamilyTalk.com. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here in American Family Radio. It's not that I've forgotten what's going on. I know President Trump is having bipartisan talks about DACA. I have audio that I had prepared from Joaquin Castro, a Democrat congressman from Texas, where he says, no DACA, no deal on the border wall. But I just felt compelled to share this with you. And we will take calls this segment. Uh, the number to call is 888-589-8840. That number, once again, is 888-589-8840. Four zero During the break, Jason and Jeff were even talking about this article even includes some of the tech titans <laughs> bragging how a part of destroying the social constructs, the social norms of the day is that they are intentionally crafting artificial intelligence to be included in the sexual interaction of human beings. <laughs> we're changing the world. Why can't we change society too? intentionally including artificial intelligence to be a part of that. And almost as if it's on cue, you remember uh, the, the name James Damore? Some of you may be familiar with that name. Some of you may not be familiar with that name. Well, I have in front of me, well, let me tell you who he is before I get to tell you what I have in front of me. Remember, James Damore was the uh, programmer at Google who just posted a, just had a memorandum that he was sharing into office titled Google's Ideological Eco Chamber, where he was lamenting the fact that at Google, as much as they were championing, championing the cause of diversity, they have no room whatsoever for diversity of thought or opinion. 
and at Google was a big deal. They were discussing uh, the, the, the fact that there was a discrepancy in the numbers of women who were involved in tech. Um, and so James Damore says for you to automatically conclude that any distinctions between men and women in their presence in tech is due to um, discrimination and nefarious activity, I have some considerations for you. I've, I've repeated many times in this program um, the adage from Thomas Sowell. And it says, well, hey, you know, in the National Football League, in most of the teams, you very rarely see a person whose skin <laughs> has happened to be melanated as mine serving as the, the field goal kicker. But does that automatically mean that the National Football League is predisposed to discrimination against people with skin color look like mine? Of course not. So there have to be other reasons, right? <laughs> so James Damore was highlighting some of these things. And one of the things he said is that, hey, guys, um, you may not know this, but men and women are different. <gasps> Did he say that? Men and women are different. They have different motivation. They have different emotions. They are built differently. There are things that are present in men that are not present in women and things that are present in women that are not present in men. And you know what happened? Google fired him. <laughs> Google fired him. <laughs> he even in his... <laughs> In his memo, he said, look, at Google, we talk much about unconscious bias that applies, as it applies to race and gender, but we rarely discuss our moral biases. Political orientation is actually a result of deep moral preferences and thus biases. Considering that the overwhelming majority of the social sciences, of which coding and engineering is included, media and Google lean left, considering that they all lean left, we should critically examine our own prejudice. Well, as a result of him writing this memorandum, Google fired James Damore. And then he had a co-worker named David Guterman who just shared the memo and invited people to comment on it. And so now James Damore and David Guterman have filed a class action lawsuit <laughs> against Google. Now, hear what I'm saying. Tie this into what I was talking about earlier, that many of these tech titans and the people that are involved in tech, they are wholly given over to not only lasciviousness, but using their position as tech people to completely reform, transform society. Now tie that into James Damore's termination from Google as a result of what he says was an ideological echo chamber. In his lawsuit, he, er, he alleges that Google has discriminated against him as well as an entire class of employees at Google for discriminating against him because his race he has less melanin in his skin than me <laughs> discrimination because he is a man and discrimination because he has conservative leaning <laughs> political beliefs in his petition he even he even argues that Google created a hostile environment for people who wanted to engage in traditional parenting styles for their own children and families not welcome at Google he says that they, they wholly celebrated and encouraged alternative lifestyles, three-parent families. You name it, they encouraged it, but concerning traditional parent families. To the place to where he even had superiors say, we don't, wanna, we don't welcome that here at Google. So James Damore is fighting back. <laughs> and he said, any heteronormative ideas are not only unwelcomed at Google, that they are actively sought to be eliminated. He said there are lots of people at Google who agree with him, but they would never let it be known that they agree with him because he knows that they would lose their job. So this is, once again, not only an idea that tolerance, in their view, is a one-way street, which that's a whole other story. I don't want to be tolerated as a human being. I'm a human. Don't just tolerate me. In medical terms, you go to the, to the doctor, and they ask you how much pain was your pain tolerance. How much can you take before you break? On a scale of 1 to 10. That's tolerance. No, as humans, we shouldn't be tolerated. But at the same time, all views are not equally inherently valuable just because they're a view. So I just offer that, that that is an interesting development at the same time that I'm coming across this article about the orgiastic activity of the tech titans in Silicon Valley, that you have James Damore who was forced to file a lawsuit for ideological Diversity. And, and quite frankly, I'll say this and we'll go to the phone lines. Most of the time when you hear the term 
diversity uh, employed, when you hear the term diversity employed, it is a welcoming of diversity in appearance, not diversity in idea or thought. With that, we'll go to the phone lines. First, we'll go, uh, well, let me say this. If you want to be a part of the show, the program, the, the phone number to call is 888-589-8840. That number, once again, is 888-589-8840. We'll go first to Georgia, where Ethan is on the phone. Ethan, thank you for calling the Hamilton Corner. Welcome to the program. Well, hello, sir. Hello, and thank you for the welcoming. You said something on uh, just uh, maybe five minutes ago or so about one race, one blood. And I wholeheartedly believe that, and, and I love hearing other people say that. The you know, I'm a prior Marine, eight years prior service, two combat tours in Iraq, and I finished up as a drill instructor on Paris Island, tra essentially training my res my recruits to to fill my shoes to replace mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And one thing I pride myself in is training all recruits equally, training all of them regardless of their race, religion, color, creed, gender. I trained them all the same. I demanded of them all the same. The extreme high standard that I the same standard that I currently now apply to my my two children by birth and my my foster children obviously mm -hmm. I raise I raise our children uh, with with uh, I guess less intensity as I did uh, developing warriors in a recruit training facility but uh, the, the same passion the same drive mm -hmm. and one thing I, I want to do is I want to I want to I wanna challenge everyone to not refer to people by the color of their skin. It's so common. You'll hear it and tell you know, you, you tell me, what was the last time you were talking to someone and they said, oh, this white guy, oh, this black guy, oh, this Hispanic guy, and, and did it not take you, it, 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 it kind of threw you off track thinking, you know, what, what, how relevant is that in this discussion? Yeah, Ethan, thank you very much for your call and your comments. And first, let me say this. Thank you for your service. It takes a special person who's willing, who will be willing to sacrifice their lives for the protections that you and I enjoy on a daily basis. I get to wake up every morning in the greatest nation known to the, in, in, in the history of the world where I have the privilege to be able to rear my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, able to uh, offer them instruction grounded in God's word on a daily basis. And I do not take that for granted. So thank you very much for your service. Now getting to your comments and and I think refer when you call refer to a person as Hispanic and think that infers a skin color that's quite frankly one of the most ignorant things you could ever spout because you have all kinds of his <laughs> skin colored people who are Hispanic and and I do agree with you um that the bible teaches and science supports that's the thing the bible teaches that we are one blood one race there's no such thing as multiple races of human beings that there is only one race of human beings they're called humans and science supports that. Dr. Ben Carson talks about that uh, when he operates on the brain of a person, <laughs> that you could take a brain of no matter what type of skin color the person would have. When you get to the brain, the brain looks the same. Eureka. What a, what a revelation. You know? So it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. But the unfortunate reality, in my opinion, that part of the reason why that we have such uh, difficulty with ethnicity in our countries because of our country's uh, difficult past and, and, and many, and, and not just difficult, tragic past, um, the unwillingness of many to grapple with the tragedy that is our, that is our past, and then the, um, <laughs> the industry that's created based on our country's past that they need current tension to continue to make themselves viable in, for economic reasons. So all of those things combine and continue. But thank you very much for your call. We'll go next to Lafayette, Louisiana, where Sherry is on the line. Sherry, thank you for calling the Hamilton Corner. Hi, Abe. I listen to your show every day, and thank you for taking my call. Oh, you are very welcome, Sherry. Go right ahead. Okay, I wanted to find out, you know, because uh, the president was meeting with uh, Congress uh, leadership about DACA today, just mm. want to find out that, you know, I know they have to compromise or they're trying to compromise, but if they grant the DACA, 
legal status, do they also have to allow them to vote, or could that be something they don't give them? Yeah. Thank you very much for your, for your call, Sherry. So first of all, they don't have to compromise. That's something that, just, that they're discussing that they want to do. Uh, but secondarily, uh, there's nothing that requires them to draft any to legislation in any particular way. So to say it differently, if they choose to make a decision granting some type of legal status to uh, the people who consider them who would be beneficiaries of who are were beneficiaries of the DACA program, they don't automatically have to grant the right to vote as a part of that. Um, they don't have to. There's nothing that makes them that would compel them to do that. Um, but whether or not they would choose to do that, that's a whole another story. But thank you for your call and your question. We'll go next to Conway. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll go next to Arkansas, where Billy is on the line. Billy, thank you for calling the Hamilton Corner. Go right ahead, Billy. Abraham Hamilton, how you doing, sir? I am blessed beyond my deserving. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, I, I was just listening, driving down the highway. I drive a truck and listen to the, uh, the Marine there. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother was a Marine, so I appreciate that, uh, that thought and expressing his service. Um, I was an army, but that's, he would probably disregard my service. <laughs> service. But uh, anyway, um, um, what, he, what he said, I, I fully comprehend why he would have said what he did. Uh, in our in our day, people are so sensitive about the silliest things. And personally, you know, the scriptures tell us that God made the nations, mm -hmm. and I think there ought to be some kind of a pride in being a black man or a white man or a Hispanic man. There's, and I'm not saying that, that we should be racist like I prefer one over another, to be uh -huh. quite frank. You know, if, if I were single and, and I found a godly black woman that loved Jesus, I would marry her. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong with us being who we are either. And no, you're absolutely right. And, and, and here's the thing, that <laughs> because of the country we live in, and thank you for your call and your, and your comments, I am so grateful to God for the way he made me and the skin color he placed me in and all of that. But the thing that happens that we live in a, such a society where people begin to make idols, <laughs> idols out of their skin colors, idols out of their cultures. And, and my, my good friends at Addison say, listen, God has blessed us to, with our skin color and the culture that he's placed us in. But the reality is that we have to make sure as believers that we don't elevate our culture above the kingdom. That's the thing. When we're able to worship the Lord for how he has made us, that he's made us fearfully and wonderfully made, it should cause us to worship our Lord instead of causing us to be in a position where we think we are separate ourselves into various segments based on something as superficial and something we had nothing to do with in the begin with as skin color. But because of the society that we live in, like I said before, that um, we have been placed in these positions. And so I've long maintained, and I will take the opportunity to reiterate it right now, that the body of Christ is uniquely positioned to be the ones to lead on this issue. Proverbs 28.5 tells us, wicked men cannot comprehend justice, but the righteous comprehend it fully because we are followers and recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are able to invade our culture with the anthropological history that the gospel is based on. He's created from one blood, all mankind. And then as he tells us in Acts 17, why did God do this? He did this so that men would seek God and find him. So when we had the conversation about us looking the way we do, we can say just the way that I tell my children, man, God made us the way we, he made us and placed us in the lands he placed us in so that men would seek God. So it's incumbent upon us to be on the Lord's team and be about our Father's business. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family